Welcome back. In this video, we're going to cover the last major topic um, about using um, Git for version control. And that's the concept of remotes, remote copies of the repository. So, so far, we've only been using Git locally. We just had a, a Git repository or database within our working directory, and that was the only copy. So now we're going to introduce the idea of having another copy of the repository somewhere else, usually on a server through a service like uh, GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket. Um, and this is important uh, for a couple of reasons. One is to sort of back up your data, right? If your laptop um, gets broken or stolen, it gets lost, you don't want to lose all, all of your work. Um, you'll have a backup of your repository remotely somewhere else on a server somewhere. The second important aspect of this is it allows you to collaborate with other people. Other people can work collaboratively on the same um, Git repository if there's a remote um, copy of it that everybody has access to. Okay. So first let's get things set up. So I am still in that um, first repository that we played around with in the previous videos. So I'm gonna move out of that and back up into that git intro folder that I created. And then I'm going to create a remote repo folder. So I'm creating a new directory, remote repo. And I'm going to remove it. I'm going to move into it using CD. So I just do PWD and just confirm I am where I think I am. So now what I'm going to do is git init uh, dash dash bear. So we've done git init before, but we didn't use this bear option. And so um, you will sort of never use this option in real life. Um, this is the command that GitHub or Bitbucket will do for you on their server when they create a remote copy of a database or a repository for you. We're just doing it here um, to sort of learn how it works. Just as it's initializing an empty copy. And if I do ls, there's the database right there. So when you remember, when we did git init the first time without bear, uh, there was nothing apparently in our directory. There was just that hidden dot git folder. But when we do bear, it's just saying, don't hide the database in the dot git folder, just put it directly in this folder. Okay. And the reason for that is that um, when you create a copy, on a server somewhere, no one's going to work directly on that copy. So it doesn't have to be hidden away in a dot .git folder. Okay. But like I said, this is all going to be taken care of for you by a, uh, by a service like GitHub. So you wouldn't normally actually have to do that. Okay. So let's keep moving. Let's now um, move out of that. And we're going to cd, we're going to make a new directory. So first of all, let's just confirm that I'm no longer in that remote repo. And then I'm going to make a new directory called Bonnie. I'm going to move in there. And then, so now what I'm sort of doing is I'm pretending I'm Bonnie. And I'm on Bonnie's computer. And she wants to work on a project, let's say, that's on GitHub. So what she's going to do is do, I'm going to do git clone, and I'm going to give the address of the repository that I want to work on. Okay, our address is very simple because our remote repo isn't actually remote. It's just right next door in a different folder. And so um, this is a very simple path here. But normally, this will actually be a URL to uh, wherever this remote repo is um, out um, on a server somewhere. Okay, so I cloned into this new repository. It's just warning me that it's an empty repository, but that's what we expected because we just created it. Okay, now if I do ls, I have a new directory here, and it's remote repo. Okay, this is Bonnie's copy of this directory, right? So there's this copy living up here, which is, you know, this is, we're pretending this is on GitHub somewhere, but when Bonnie said git clone that um, repo. She now has her own local copy. Okay, So I'm just going to do PWD and show you that 
I am in bon the Bonnie folder. And I'm going to change into her, I'm moving into her copy of this project. Um, and then I'll do git remote dash V. And so this is just showing me um, that there is uh, what is called a remote that has the alias origin. Okay, so origin here is just an alias for the address of where the remote copy of this project is. Okay, and the name origin isn't special in any way, just like master wasn't special in terms of branches. It's just the default um, name that's given to sort of your first um, remote copy. Okay, so there's, this is just an alias to this address of where the remote copy is. And that's what I just said. Origin is the alias for the re repo in another directory. Or um, when you actually start using Git, it's usually going to be um, somewhere else on a server somewhere. OK, so let's create some content here. Um, well, hello again, dummy. So I'm going to create um, a new file, dummy.txt. Um, with one line that says, well, hello again, dummy. So I'll do ls. Sure enough, it's there. I'm going to add it to the staging area. I'll do get status. Um, so there's no, nothing committed yet. We're on the master branch because that's sort of the default branch. Um, and there are changes, and they are in the staging area. They're ready to be committed. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and commit that. Once again, I'm going to use the dash M here to keep things moving along, but best, pra best practices is not to do that. You want to write good descriptive commit messages. Okay, so to get status, all right. So um, I'm, on, um, I'm on a master branch, and now it's saying that that branch is based on another branch, origin master. Um, and there's nothing to commit. Uh, and the working tree is clean. OK. So now what we're going to do is get a new command, git for push origin master. OK. And what this is is that I'm saying I want to push my copy, any updates on in my database, to this other copy of the database. And specifically, I want to, I want to uh, push any updates that are on my master branch. Okay, so I'm saying git push to origin. And remember, origin, let me scroll up here, is just an alias, right? So it's just an alias for where that remote repository is. So I'm saying git push to that other copy of the repository, my master branch. There we go. So it's saying that um, it's writing some objects, gives you some output, and it's showing you where it's pushing to, and it's showing that's creating a new branch, master, and it, um, from our mas our local master branch. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get status um, and see how Git views the world. It says I'm on the master branch, and it's up to date with the master branch. Uh, on the rem remote copy of the repository. Um, and there's there's nothing to commit. <clears throat> now if we do git branch dash A, you can see that there is not only our local master copy, our, our local master branch, there is now a remote origin master branch. So remember when I was teaching you branches, I told you that um, you might not be using <clears throat> branches explicitly very often if you're new to using Git, but you'll sort of be using them all the time implicitly. And that's the case. So really you can think about these remote, um, these remote copies of the repository are just another branch, right? So this is just another branch um, and, and it's just got a, a new name to sit to sort of tell you that it's that it's um, that it is it is related to the 
remote copy of the repository. All right. <clears throat> and so the other, I, I think this might actually be the last um, new command that you'll learn is git pull. So um, let's say, you know, uh, Bonnie takes a break. She comes back two days later to work on this project. The first thing she probably wants to do is to pull down any changes that any, somebody else, anybody else has made while she was not working on the project. And she does that. It's the same sort of idea as git push, git pull. You use that origin alias to specify where you want to pull from and what branch you want to pull from. So git pull origin master. And no, no, obviously nobody's worked on this repository, so nothing new um, was, was <clears throat> pulled down. So it says it's already up to date. It would be kind of worrying if there were changes considering <laughs> it's, right, it's right on my computer. I would definitely be worried about the security of my, my laptop if there were changes when I pulled. Okay, um, so this is what you're probably going to use most of the time, but I'm going to tell you that what this is actually doing for you is it's actually doing two commands um, sort of behind the scenes. What it's doing is it's first using git fetch to get any new commits to the remote branch origin master. And then it's actually using git merge, just like we learned how to do in the last video, to merge any changes that it sees in origin master into our master branch, okay? Let me show you what I mean by that. So um, git pull origin master, what git is doing for you behind the scenes is it's actually first doing git fetch origin master, which is basically just um, pulling down any new snapshots that it finds on the remote copy. And then it's saying um, whatever new stuff is on this branch that is now I have locally, I want to merge in any new stuff into my master branch. Okay, so um, there's nothing magical going on here. Um, these remote repositories really are just branches, just what we learned in the last video. Um, they just have special names so that you are aware that um, that the sort of where these branches are, that they're associated with the remote copy. But once you fetch, it's just like any other branch in your database. Okay, so like I said, most of the time you're just gonna do git pull origin master, but sometimes it's nice to do this in two steps like this, because what you can do between git fetch and git merge is this, you can do git diff origin master. That lets you see what are the differences between the origin master branch and my master branch before you merge. So if you do git fetch and then git diff, you can actually see what the differences are that you're about to merge and create a new snapshot um, in, uh, in your copy of the database. So this can be useful. So I'm just pointing that out here. But most of the time, you'll just be doing this, which will do both of these steps for you. Okay, so now let's pretend to be a, a collaborator of Bonnie. So I'm gonna go up two directories. So let me just do a PWD so you can see where I am. I am in Bonnie's copy of the remote repository. So I'm gonna move back out into git intro just by backing out two directories. There I am. So I'm outside of Bonnie's repo. I'm gonna make a new um, folder or, or directory called Clyde, and I'm gonna move in there. Um, if I do ls, there's nothing there. But now Clyde, I'm pretending I'm now a different person, Clyde on a different computer, and I wanna work on this project. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, clone a copy of the repository. And now if I do ls, now Clyde on his computer has a copy 
of this project called Remote Repo. Okay. So now we're going to, now we are, so let me do PWD. Now, we're now in Clyde's copy of the project or the repository. Okay. So I, as Clyde, we're going to add a new line to dummy.txt, okay? So we're, first Clyde's going to go, okay, what's going on in here? Oh, there's a line in dummy.txt. So he's going to add a line to that file by doing I'm no dummy. And he's going to append that to the file. Okay. So just to confirm, I've added a new line to that file. I'm going to add that to the staging area, that new content in dummy.txt. And then I'm going to commit that. Okay, so get commit. And then, so there's one extra step now that we're working with a remote repository, and that's the push. So git push origin master. So that is pushing all of my, all the changes that Clyde made up to the remote copy of the repository and updating that remote copy to um, reflect the changes that Clyde has made. Okay. So now we're actually going to go back to being Bonnie. So now I'm, I'm going back over into Bonnie's copy of this project. And if I do, if I look in dummy.txt, it still only has one line, right? Because the new line is in the remote copy and in Clyde's copy, but not in Bonnie's copy. So she's got a pull. So get pull origin master. And now if we look in dummy.txt, there is that new line that, um, that Clyde added. Okay, so Bonnie's gonna work on this a bit. She's gonna um, open dummy.txt. I'm gonna use them, but just use whatever text editor you're most comfortable with. She's gonna come in here and, and make some edits. So she's gonna change, she's gonna put a comma after well. Well, hello, dumb. well, hello again, dummy. Close that up, okay. And then she's gonna add that new content in dummy.txt to the staging area, commit it, adding comma to dummy.txt. And then the, that, the new step that we're learning is, is, is how to transmit our changes to the remote copy. So that's git push, okay. So now let's go back to being Clyde. Okay, so I'm now in Clyde's copy of the project. And he is gonna go ahead and work on dummy.txt too. He's gonna put a comma after, again, you notice that Bonnie's copy is not here, right? It's in Bonnie's copy and it's in the remote copy but Clyde hasn't pulled yet. He doesn't have that update yet on his computer, on his copy of this project. So he's adding a comma somewhere else. Okay. Next, he's going to add that change to the staging area, and he's going to commit it. And then he's going to try to push it, but rejected. What? He's like, what's going on? I just tried to push and I'm rejected. So what happened is he is behind, right? So he actually doesn't have the most up-to-date version of the database that's on the remote copy because Bonnie is pushed um, since, uh, since Clyde's last poll. So there's new stuff up on the remote copy of the database that he doesn't have yet. And so when you try to push, when you're behind, Git will reject you saying, you nope, nope, nope. You need to pull first and make sure you have the most up-to-date version of the database before you can update this remote copy. Okay, so what Clyde needs to do is first pull and then push, okay? 
So what he's going to have to do is go, okay, I got rejected. I must, and I must be behind. And it says that it gives you a bunch of hints. Updates were rejected because the remote contains work that you do not have locally. Okay. This is usually caused by another repository pushing to the same REST. So basically somebody else has pushed um, some new content that you don't have yet. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, get pull origin master. And it's going to go, ah, there's a conflict. It tries to auto merge the differences on the remote copy and Clyde's copy, but it runs into a conflict. Okay, so it says merge conflict in dummy.txt because the automatic merge failed. Remember, this is what happens if there are changes um, on the same line on two different snapshots that you're trying to that you're trying to merge. Okay, so what happened when Clyde pulled is it first fetched um, um, any changes to the data database that were on the remote copy, um, and then it tried to merge the origin master branch, which would have been pointed to that last snapshot that, that, um, that Bonnie made into his copy. But there were differences that conflicted, okay? So what we can do is, let's say I could get status. Okay, what is it telling us? Okay, so we have um, one, we have unmerged paths. So the, it's basically telling you that your branch and the origin master branch are different. They've diverged and they have one and one different commits each. So it's showing you that, that um, you tried to merge things that were um, different snapshots and there are unmerged paths because the merge failed because there were conflicts. And it's telling you what files you have to go into to resolve those conflicts, okay? So what um, Clyde needs to do next is op open dummy.txt with his text editor and go in and resolve this conflict. So here is that syntax again that Git adds for us to sort of flag the areas of the file that we need to resolve. So what it's showing Clyde is it's saying, hey, Clyde, you have this in your snapshot in your current version of the database. But origin master has this, okay? What do you want me to do? Because, you know, Git does not try to make these, um, resolve these itself because you wouldn't want it to. It doesn't know whether to prefer this or this or merge them together because it's not a person, <laughs> it's not a human, right? So it needs human intervention here. So now it's up to Clyde. He has to decide, do I like my version better or do I like Bonnie's version better? Okay. Or maybe he prefers both. So he goes with this. So what he's doing is, let me, um, let me undo that quickly. So what, what I did is I, 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 I sort of compromised. I said, well, I kind of like both of these commas. And then you just have to delete all the extra stuff, right? So we don't want this line twice. So we're deleting one of them and we're deleting all the, the content that Git added because those were just put there so that we could find where in the file we had to resolve the conflict, which is very helpful. Obviously in these toy examples, it's pretty easy to find, but if you have a you know, 2000 line file, it's very helpful to be able to quickly and easily find where the conflicts are due to these sort of obnoxious um, symbols that, that Git adds for you. Those are easy to search for. Okay, so this is what Clyde's decided to do. This is how he decided to, to res resolve this conflict. Okay, and now he's gonna do um, uh, get status. Um, and once again, it's just sort of reiterating that we have this, this we have divergent um, snapshots here that we're trying to merge together and there was a conflict. Okay, and what he needs to do now, let me catch up on the slides here, is, okay, this is what we just did. He has to go in and manual, manually resolve this conflict, which we've already done. And then, um, he has to add um, 
dummy.txt. So he's modified this. He's sort of found a compromise way of resolving this conflict. Now he has to, that's new content, right? That's never existed before. In the database, he has to move that new content into the staging area so then it can be committed to the database. So git, sorry, add dummy.txt and then git commit. I'm gonna put the dash M here just to keep things moving along a little bit faster. Okay, so git commit dash M resolving comma conflict and then git push origin master. And then the push is successful because um, uh, Clyde now is up to date. His copy of the repository is, is up to date and now he can push to the remote copy, okay? All right, so um, what Clyde should have done is pulled before he started working and he would have avoided that conflict. If he would have pulled, he would have gotten that new comma before he even started working. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit more about best practices, but you wanna pull regularly, especially if you've been away from the project for a little bit and there's other people working on it, pull before you get started because that is going to um, minimize these conflicts that you have to resolve. Okay. Now let's go back to being Bonnie. So I'm now in Bonnie's copy of the project. Now if I look in dummy.txt, her comma is there, but not um, Clyde's. So Bonnie's gonna be a little bit more clever than Clyde. She's gonna go, okay, I, I'm coming back to this project. Before I do any work, I probably wanna pull and make sure I have the most up-to-date version of things. So she pulls, get pull origin master. And now if we look in dummy.txt, she'll see that um, Clyde added this an another comma. All right, so that is the concept of a remote repository. So really the only two new things that we learned in this video is really pull and push, the new git commands that you'll be using regularly when you're using git um, because you're most likely are gonna have remote copies of repositories um, at places like GitHub um, or, or GitLab or Bitbucket. So, and I hope that helps sort of resolve, a lot of people are sometimes confused, you know, what's the difference between Git and GitHub and GitLab and these things. So Git is the version control software. Um, it's what we've been using. GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, these are just um, web servers that allow you to put remote copies of repositories on their servers. Um, and then they have some extra bells and whistles for convenience, but um, they're just essentially just web servers that allow you to keep your remote copies there. That's the difference. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about best practices. I'll keep this brief. So you just wanna stay up to date. So if you wanna pull often, so git pull, whatever the remote alias is, the default origin, whatever the branch is, the default is, is master. Um, you wanna commit often. So don't make a million changes and then uh, commit to the database. You wanna commit often for a lot of reasons. One is it's gonna minimize conflicts. Two is it just gives you more places to get back to. Um, it, it's sort of, if you can imagine going off into a forest somewhere without a compass and you have bread, you wanna leave a lot of crumbs behind you. If you space them out every mile, it's gonna be really hard to find your way back. But if you leave one every 10 feet, it's gonna be very easy to find your way back well, unless something's eating your bread, but that's, that's where the analogy fails, I guess. But you get the idea. If you commit often, you're just leaving a, a much better trail of bread crumbs. So if you ever have to get back to something, you can. And you wanna push often. And um, always pull before you push because um, it's not too important because if you do the, the opposite way around, Git is gonna tell you. It's just gonna say, nope, you can't push. You need to pull first, okay? So it's just, you just wanna be doing this stuff regularly. 
push often, pull often, and commit often. And that's going to minimize conflicts, um, and it's going to make your experience using Git better and um, give you more power, too, because you're going to have more places that you can get back to if you need to. Um, another quick thing about best practices that I wanted to mention is I, I mentioned this very briefly in, I think, the first video, is um, Git works really well with text files. And the reason for that is, is it can actually track them line by line, as we saw. It actually keeps track of changes line by line, and it can find conflicts. Um, and what's nice is then with text files, it can do um, those auto merging for us. If there's changes on different lines, it'll automatically um, um, resolve um, those differences for us. So it doesn't work as well for other types of files. Um, like a Word document isn't a, a raw text file or a PDF. You can track those in Git, but it, it's, not gonna ha it's not gonna be as powerful. It's not gonna be able to do sort of the line by line. Um, well, it is gonna be trying to track it line by line, but the problem is, is when you modify those types of files, the differences propagate to um, a lot of different lines. Um, and so it's, it's, it's going to slow Git down quite a bit. It's fine to keep those files, uh, track those files with Git, but it's, you just don't want to be modifying them all the time. Um, and if you do, um, a lot of the tools like Git diff and stuff like that aren't, aren't going to work uh, very well. Another thing that I wanted to mention is that um, you don't want to use Git for really, really, really big data files. So if you have humongous you know, gigabyte um, size data files, you don't want to track those with Git because it's going to slow Git uh, down a lot because it's going to try to track, keep track of those contents of those files line by line, which uh, slows things down if the files are huge. There are um, tools um, to, that allow you to work with really big files um, in, in Git. Um, the, the, the sort of easiest to use one, and I think the sort of most popular one, is Git LFS. It's an extension to Git that allows you to work with really big files in a way that doesn't sort of um, drag Git down. So it's Git LFS. It stands for Large File Storage, I believe. Um, but if you're, if you're new to Git, you probably, you know, Probably won't have to deal with that um, straight away. <clears throat> All right, so that's some of the uh, best practices. Um, there is a, an exercise that you can do to sort of practice some of the skills that we've learned in these videos. Um, and here is the URL and the link to that. Um, it's best to do this with other people. So if you can find you know, one, two, three other people to do the exercise collaboratively with, that's going to um, um, be best, but it, you can also do it solo. Um, it's it's going to help you practice using all of the all of the Git commands um, that we've learned in these videos. So I definitely recommend that you do it because um, then you actually are applying the things you've learned that will help the concepts stick in your mind. Um, and then uh, resources, um, Git is very well documented, so take advantage of that. This is a link to the Git documentation. Um, and it's very thorough. Also, Git is very popular, which means Google can get you a very long way. So don't hes hesitate to Google things if you are confused. Um, some quick acknowledgments. A lot of the stuff, uh, a lot of the content in these, um, in these, in these slides and in this presentation um, borrowed heavily from a Git exercise written by Mark Holder. Uh, and that's the link to that is here. So thank you, Mark. Um, I definitely appreciate um, that content and um, support. Um, uh, thank you, NSF, for um, providing, uh, keeping the lights on for us to, to do this sort of fun stuff. All right, that ends our series um, introducing um, version control using Git.